Welcome everyone to part 3 of the sci-fi first person shooter tutorial series. In this video we're going to customize the projectile that our weapon fires by customizing the sound that it makes when it's fired, customizing its scale when it's spawned, and changing its material so that it more resembles a sci-fi blaster bolt. Before we start the video let's go ahead and open our master FPS character and we'll be turning off Tick for this blueprint as we won't be needing to use Tick for him. If you don't know, Tick generally refers to running a piece of code in a regular interval, which by default is set to be every frame during play, and it can become pretty resource intensive since it's firing every frame. Although we don't have anything happening on event tick, the editor still checks every frame since we're ticking, and turning off tick like we're about to do will prevent it from performing this check, therefore theoretically saving on resources at least a little bit. Let's go ahead and stay on our class default, and by default, the engine has start with tick enabled set to true here in the details panel. And start with tick enabled is set to true not only for the actor itself, but also for all of its components. So let's turn this actor's tick setting off manually by turning this setting here to false. We'll also want to turn off tick for all of its components. And to easily do that, we'll go ahead and select all of them while holding control. We don't have to select the arrow component because that one doesn't have any details. And we can turn off start with tick enabled here once again in the details panel for the component tick. Now we can go ahead and compile our master FPS character and they officially do not start with tick enabled. We also didn't delete our white SCK folder from the last video, so we can do that now as long as you followed along reassigning all of the skeletal meshes. Be sure to right click and delete the folder. And it looks like one of our skeletal meshes is still referencing the physics asset from the mannequin folder, but we can go ahead and force delete it since we'll be replacing the physics asset later anyways. Let's finish cleaning up our project by deleting all of the arms meshes animations in our animation folder. We can do that just by holding shift, selecting one side, and selecting the other. That way they're all selected, and now we can delete them. And now we should be able to delete our temp arms folder. And it looks like one of the material functions is still referencing one texture that's in this folder, so we can go ahead and open up that material and see that it is this texture here and replace it just with the other UE4 logo card that isn't in that folder that we're deleting. It's an exact duplicate, so we should be able to apply and save. Once the shaders are compiled, we can go ahead and close that, and we should be able to go ahead and delete our temp arms folder by hitting force delete. And if you didn't know, I always do a test run for this project before I film the video. And during that first run, I ran into the same issue that we had during part one of the series, where the folder would remain behind since the engine is still referencing some of the assets and memory. And in that case, even saving the project and fixing up redirectors for the folder didn't do the job. If this is the case for you, you should be able to just close the project, reopen it, and then be able to delete the folder after reopening. It's kind of a pain, but at least we end up with a completely clean and organized project. With all of that done, we should be able to focus on our projectile blueprint, and make it closer to a Star Wars blaster bolt. So let's go ahead and navigate to the projectile in the blueprints folder. And we should probably give this a better, more descriptive name by renaming it with F2. And let's go ahead and call it BP Master Projectile. We'll give it this name in case we want to make children classes for this projectile in the future. I don't plan on it during the series, but if the project is expanded, it's good to have this sort of naming convention already in place. And I'm going to organize these four blueprints in our blueprints folder really quickly just by creating four folders. We can go ahead and name the first one Characters. When we create the second, we can go ahead and name that one Environmental. Let's make another, and we can go ahead and call this one Game Framework. And for the fourth and last one, we can call that one Widgets. We'll go ahead and put the Master FPS Character into our Characters folder, Master Projectile into Environmental, First Person Game Mode into Game Framework, and although our First Person HUD isn't technically a widget or UMG, 
it does play a similar role here so we'll go ahead and put it into our widgets folder and I'm gonna select all of these right click and set the color to blue now we can open our environmental folder and get started on our BP master projectile when we open it up we'll notice that the event graph is mostly empty since the projectile really doesn't do too much in fact this is everything right here. When this actor hits anything, it checks to see if that thing is simulating physics. If it's not, it doesn't do anything. If it is, it'll add impulse at a location. That location is where its location is, and it hits with its velocity times 100, and then it destroys itself. And when an actor destroys itself, it essentially despawns it in layman terms. While we're here, I'm going to make this comment box a little more visually appealing by turning off the show bubble when zoomed. I really just don't find it helpful and I'm not a fan of how that bubble looks. And I'll change the comment box color to something like a teal. So we'll just turn red to a zero. Now when I flip back and forth from my master first person character back to my projectile blueprint, we'll more easily be able to tell which blueprint we're currently editing. Let's go ahead and navigate from the event graph to the viewport and we'll be able to visually see this actor. And we'll quickly see that this actor is the projectile that's fired from our master character's gun. This projectile actor is made of three components which we can see here in the components tab. The root component is a collision sphere that generates the hit events when it hits things in the level. And when this component does hit things, that's actually what generates this event hit. Attached to the sphere collision is a static mesh component, and this static mesh component gives the visuals for the whole actor. The static mesh is currently set to a simple static mesh with one material on it. And the last component is a projectile movement component, which by itself adds all of the logic for our projectile to jettison in a specified direction when it's spawned, which is super helpful for our projectile. We also won't need tick enabled for this actor or its components, so let's go ahead and turn that off in the class defaults, and we can select all three of these and turn off start when tick enabled under component tick. Compile and save. Since it is our master first person character that spawns our projectile, we should quickly reference where that happens. So let's minimize our master projectile go back to the blueprints folder, enter our character folder, and open our master FPS character. When we open up the master FPS character, ensure that you're on the event graph, and we can use our right mouse button to move around the event graph, and our scroll wheel to zoom in. And you can see when we hit our input for action fire, it spawns an actor, and we specify that actor to be our master projectile blueprint. And we also specified the transform, which is the location, rotation, and scale for that actor when it spawned. And after that actor spawned, our master first person character plays a sound at this location where our master character is. We're actually going to change the sound here so that the sound the projectile plays isn't determined by the master character, but by the projectile itself when it spawned. So let's go ahead and delete the play sound at location and the get actor location nodes that are connected to the spawn actor node. Otherwise, once we're done, we'll end up playing two sounds for each projectile. With that code deleted, we can play it in the level editor and notice that no sounds are being played since we deleted that code. So let's go ahead and set up a sound to be played from the projectile itself. So we'll navigate to environmental folder and open our BP master projectile. Let's navigate to the event graph, and finally we can start doing some visual scripting for our project. We're going to want our projectile to play a sound when it's spawned. Luckily, the engine has some built-in events, and we can see them by right-clicking on the event graph and typing in event. We can see a lot of events, which are pretty self-explanatory. Event tick, for example, is what we've already talked about, an event that happens every frame. Event destroyed will be called when this actor is destroyed, aka despawn, like we talked about earlier. And up above, we have event actor begin overlap, which would be called when the actor overlaps another actor or a component of another actor. The event we're going to be using is called event begin play. 
So that means that this event will fire when play begins for this actor, and that includes when the actor is spawned, like we're doing with our master projectile. And at this point, event begin play, we will want a sound to be played when this actor spawned, and we have actually three options for how this happens. The first method is called spawn sound 2D. This node will directly play a sound with no attenuation at all, which means it disregards any distance that this actor may have from your character or any listening actors. Which means that this type of sound is generally best for a user interface because you don't have to worry about sound changing volume based on distances or anything like that. The second type of sound that we can play is called play sound at location. And this node, as the name suggests, plays a sound at a specified location. This is the node that was in our master FPS character before we deleted it. And this node is one of the simplest ways to play a sound at a specified location. We'll have to set up something called an attenuation so that the engine can determine how to change the volume on the sound based on the distance from listening objects. A downside for playing this type of sound is that you can't set it to a variable, which means that once the sound is played, you can't alter it in any way. Alternatively to this, we could add an audio component to our actor and assign a sound there and use that, but I think play sound at location is easier to explain and use for beginners. And the third option that we have is called spawn sound attached. This node is great for sounds that move, like things that whiz by the character, but we're not really going to worry about adding that much detail to our blaster bolts. In fact, let's choose to use the play sound at location and delete the other two nodes. And we'll go ahead and hook that up to event begin play. And now with play sound at location, we'll have to specify which sound we want this node to play. Right now we only really have the one sound, which is the first person template weapon fire 02, so let's go ahead and select that. And you'll notice we also have to specify the location that the sound is played. And we can simply use our projectile actor's location so we can right click and type in get actor location and plug the vector directly into the location. With that done, let's compile and save and we can play in the editor to see that our sound is now playing again. And the sound is actually coming from the projectile itself. Now you might be thinking to yourself, why did we do all that to basically get the same result that we had before? Well, there's actually a few reasons for that, but the main one is so that we can give ourselves a much easier way to customize how this blaster bolt sounds when it's spawned. Let's go ahead and move this up a little bit to give ourselves some more space, and we can click on the drop down for play sound at location to give ourselves more options when the sound is played. Now you can see that we can change the volume, the pitch, the attenuation settings, etc. for each projectile that's fired. And what we're going to do is set these values to variables, which will allow ourselves to change the value of those variables when we spawn each projectile. So let's go ahead and right click on the volume multiplier and click on promote to variable. We can do the same for the pitch multiplier as well. And let's drag these down to make them a little bit more neat and orderly. Compile and save. Okay, so the useful tip I'm about to show you is best demonstrated by looking at the master character now. Let's go, let's go back to our master FPS character, and you can see that when we spawn our master projectile, we currently only have these options here. We can choose its transform when it's spawned, we can choose its collision settings, and its owner and its instigator as well. But if we go back to our master projectile, select the volume multiplier, we should be able to change it to instance editable, and the more important part here is changing them also to expose on spawn. Let's do the same for our pitch multiplier, we have to change it to instance editable in order to allow it to be exposed on spawn. Let's compile and save. Now we can go back to our first person character. Let's right click on this node and refresh the node. And we can instantly see that we have the option to set what those two variables will be for the specified instance that's spawned by our master FPS character. So let's change the pitch here to something like 0.7 and test it out so we can instantly see if it's happening in real time. Go back to play an editor. 
And notice how much deeper the sound is when we fire our gun. This is going to come in handy when we set up all the code for different firing modes for our gun. And remember that we can do this expose on spawn for any variable for any blueprint that's ever spawned. In fact, let's go back to our master projectile and do the same for the sound that's played from our play sound at location. Go ahead and make that instance editable and expose on spawn, compile and save. And doing that will allow us to change the sound that's played whenever we spawn this actor. Let's stay with our master projectile. I like to keep my variables organized as well, so I'm going to categorize them by selecting one of them and changing the category that it's in in the details panel. The way that I change this category is by deleting this text here and manually typing in a fitting category name. I'll call this one audio parameters. That will go ahead and put this variable underneath a tab called audio parameters. And to put other variables in the same category, we can go ahead and just select it and drag and drop it right into the audio parameters category. Let's do the same for the sound as well. And I'll actually drag and put that on top, compile and save. Let's finish off the rest of the video by focusing on customizing the physical appearance of our projectile. If we return to the viewport, we can see that our blaster bolt is too spherical and way too yellow to be convincingly in Star Wars. And while looking at the blueprint, we can kind of tell that we don't really need a collision component for our projectile since the static mesh can also generate hit events. So let's drag our static mesh to the root component and drop it here to make it the new root. In fact, I'm going to rename our static mesh from sphere to something more fitting like projectile mesh. And now our projectile mesh is the root component, so we can go ahead and delete our sphere collision component. But the collision settings and the scale when it's spawned aren't correctly set up at this moment. In fact, we can test that out by once again playing in the editor. We can see that it just goes through everything and it spawns this giant static mesh. Ideally, the static mesh that we use for our projectile mesh would be the exact size that we want it when it's fired so that we can keep the scale at 111 since right now spawning it at 111 is a little bit larger than we intend. Let's go back to our master projectile and we can change the size and get it closer to the correct size by changing its scale here in the details panel. I tinkered with the scale a little bit and the scale that I got to be closer was 0 0.25, 0 0.03, 0 0.03 but we have to change this lock here to unlock so that it's not uniformly changing the scale. We can go ahead and select Y, do 0 0.03 and also with Z. And also while we're editing the projectile mesh, let's scroll down to the collision settings. Since we do want this component to generate hit events, we no longer need it to generate overlap and instead of no collision, we can go ahead and change that to block all dynamic. Now, in order to have our projectile spawn with this specified scale, we actually need to go back to our master FPS character and on the spawn actor node for the transform, we need to change the scale here. So remember to go ahead and change it to 0 0.25, 0 0.03 and 0 0.03, compile and save. Having to do that little extra step is why it's a little annoying to not have the correct size for our static mesh, but we'll make it work regardless. Let's go back to our master projectile and now we just want to create a custom material for this static mesh. Creating materials can be its entire own tutorial series, so I'm just going to skim the basics during this tutorial. Our goal is to change this material from this shiny yellow blob to an illuminated glowing red color. So let's go ahead and minimize our projectile, navigate to our materials folder, and we can create a new material by right clicking and selecting new material here. Let's call it something like M base projectile. So we know that it's a material for our projectile and we can open it up. Now we should have a blank material. And with this, we can go ahead and customize the visual properties. Our material is going to be really simple since we only need to plug something into the emissive color, which as you can see is part of the material that glows. Everything else can be default. So let's plug a color into the emissive. One of the easiest ways to do that is to get a vector parameter. We'll go ahead and right click, 
type in vector parameter, and let's give it a name here in the details panel called base color. Now in the material editor, a vector normally has three, in this case four, values. And those values determine the color that the vector represents. We can select the color that we want by going to the default value, clicking there, and let's go ahead and just make this a bright red with a one on alpha. And if we plug the RBGA into the emissive color, we should get a nice red color. But this isn't exactly what we're looking for. This is just kind of a flat red color. So our goal now is to brighten this color, and the best way to do that is to multiply it by a value. You can multiply it by something called a constant or by something called a scalar parameter. So let's right click, go ahead and type in multiply, put that right in the way, and we can plug the base color into the A and plug the output into the emissive color. And what we're going to plug into the B is not a constant, which you can actually set here. Let's see if I raise the constant and apply, it is going to brighten it up quite a lot. But in order to change this value, I'd have to come back into the material, change the value, apply again, have all the shaders recompile, and then finally I can see the change in the value. In order to avoid all of that recompile time, what we're gonna do is get a scalar parameter, and let's call that brightness, and plug that into B with a default value of one, apply and save, and it's still going to be that flat red color until the next step, where we go ahead and minimize this material and create something called a material instance. Let's call it MI Blaster Bolt, so that we know what this material instance is meant to represent. And now we can open this material instance, and it's going to look a little bit different than the regular material editor. We should be able to see the material here in the viewport, but in the details panel, we can override the default values that we set for our parameters. So let's click true to override the brightness in the details panel, and we can just go ahead and turn up the brightness quite a lot to get that glowing color. I ended up with a pretty high value of around 700 to my liking. That seems to brighten up the material and the area around it as well. And we can save that material instance head back to our master projectile for our projectile mesh. We can change the material that's applied to the static mesh by clicking here on the drop down and now selecting our MI Blaster Bolt Material Instance and see that applied immediately to our projectile mesh. And now if we play in the editor, we should be firing our very bright red blaster bolts. Nice. Well, I think that's a good place to end the video. Once again, we covered a lot of topics in this video. Everything from turning off event tick, to reorganizing our blueprints folder, how to place sounds from a blueprint, setting up variables that are exposed on spawn, and creating a customizable material that we can apply to any mesh. I really hope you learned something. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. I'm Joe Von D, here to help you think like a game developer. Stay tuned for the next video in the tutorial series where we will be finishing our projectile.